<coughs> well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, accommodating our early start uh, date, our start time for uh, today's uh, briefing. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, Amy Eubank and Kelly Holt of our uh, office um, who uh, make this uh, event come together. And I know uh, the issues are the draw. Um, the panel is the draw, but we have gotten consistent feedback from our um, very statistically, uh, scientifically rigorous evaluations um, that the beer bread is a draw. <laughs> and uh, we're delighted to have the beer bread. Um, I want to make some opening comments to kind of um, set the stage for uh, the terrific panel that um, we have this uh, morning and early afternoon to talk about a very timely and relevant issue, and that is welfare reform. And um, we start with 1996, when federal, health, federal welfare reform in 1996 uh, really fundamentally restructured the approach, the financing, and the attended goals of welfare reform in our country. Um, the longstanding Aid to Families with Dependent Children program, or AFDC, which principally provided income support to low-income uh, families with children, AFDC was replaced by a new program, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF program, Gesundheit. Um, and TANF was the product of bipartisan legislation by Congress that was enacted by then uh, President Bill Clinton. Um, it was legislation that placed an emphasis on work and self-sufficiency and gave states broad discretion in terms of how to structure, design, and implement their programs consistent with state priorities, goals, and circumstances. California's response to federal uh, reform to TANF was CalWORKs. Uh, and CalWORKs stands for California Work Opportunity and Responsibility to Kids. Uh, it, too, was a product of bipartisan legislation that was signed into law by then-Governor Pete Wilson. Um, it is a program that, in many respects, uh, embodied, uh, or its name embodies, the twin goals uh, of CalWORKs, in terms of supporting work and supporting children. CalWORKs, since its inception, really has been a, a core part of California's safety net of support and services for low-income families with children. Uh, at the same time, over the course of its now 16-year history, it has been shaped by a number of factors, uh, factors that really uh, invite, if not compel, our policymakers to step back and think about the goals, the structure, the approach, and the future directions of CalWORKs. Uh, one such factor that we'll, we'll hear a little bit about this afternoon um, are the original decisions and goals made by policymakers at the beginning of CalWORKs, uh, decisions that have helped, um, uh, in part, uh, influence the, the, the profile of the people who are now served, both in terms of the number of cases on CalWORKs as well as the profile, uh, with just over half of households supported by CalWORKs headed by adults who either are not eligible to work, are not participating in work, required work activity, or are unable to access work. Uh, a profile that prompts consideration of the work focus uh, and work-related goals of CalWORKs. Uh, certainly our current economic climate is another factor that uh, encourages consideration of how do we support and reinforce work an environment where jobs are scarce and where the economic recovery is slow, um, particularly for those who fall at the lower end of the income distribution. Uh, federal TANF rules um, really provide a lot of flexibility, that, but they also provide uh, the guideposts, if you will, for how states approach and structure their programs and how success uh, is measured. Uh, TANF is due for reauthorization, indeed it's overdue, uh, and that provides an opportunity for states and policymakers to think about, well, what are some of the lessons learned over the course of the past 16 years uh, and how do we strengthen this program going forward, both in the context of good economic times and more challenging economic times? And finally, California's enduring budget crisis, uh, which has compelled deep reductions in darn near every uh, program in state government supported with general fund, including CalWORKs, really compels considerations by our policymakers of how do we balance uh, the goals of the CalWORKs program in the context of growing need, declining resources, and fierce competition for the general fund resources that are available. Uh, Governor Brown's budget certainly invites this kind of uh, consideration uh, with its proposal to really refocus and recalibrate uh, CalWORKs by limiting welfare to work uh, resources or access to those resources for a, a smaller period of time um, by modifying our state's uh, work participation requirements to more closely uh, align and be consistent with federal rules and requirements. Uh, and by sharply reducing ba basic assistance to families um, whose parents are no longer eligible for aid. Today's briefing is intended to provide a foundation uh, in terms of understanding the history and the evolution uh, of CalWORKs um, and to help use that to help inform our thinking about current challenges as well as future directions. 
Um, we're going to begin by Caroline Danielson, who's a policy fellow at PPIC, who's going to provide an overview uh, of the history and evolution of CalWORKs and provide a snapshot of caseload trends and dynamics. Uh, we're then going to hear from our state director of the Department of Social Services, Will Lightborn, who's going to talk about how CalWORKs fits into the broader uh, fabric of uh, safety net uh, and employment and training uh, support related programs. Uh, Bruce Wagstaff from Sacramento County is then going to give us an on the ground perspective of uh, both uh, the challenges and the opportunities of um, implementing uh, CalWORKs in our current uh, environment. Uh, and finally, Scott Graves is going to go from, we're going to go from the micro on the ground with uh, Bruce to the macro uh, economic uh, perspective uh, by Scott Graves of California Budget Pro Project to give us that uh, economic context within which CalWORKs and other uh, safety net and income support programs uh, occur. I would encourage you to look at the bios in your handout for more information. We're going to have comments by each of the panelists and then some discussion, and then we'll be turning it all over, uh, turning it over to you all for some uh, Q and A with the audience. So, Caroline, let's uh, let's get started with you. Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming today. Let me first um, orient you to the handouts. Apart from the agenda and your evaluation form, you have a handout. Um, one of which Scott will talk about and one of which um, I'm going to talk about. And because my figures are not as large as Scott's, let me say that if you turn over the first page, you'll see the two figures that in a few minutes I'll be referring to. So as Kim indicated, um, CalWORKs is a program that began in 1998. It had a predecessor program, but it was designed um, deliberately by policymakers um, and um, to embody two overarching goals one of which was to protect children, to provide a safety net for children, um, in other words, immediate income support, in a short-term goal of, of income support when, um, when family incomes are low. But it also had another important goal, um, which is to um, help families to reach self-sufficiency or at least to improve their self-sufficiency. In other words, to help them earn their way off CalWORKs, although not necessarily off other safety net programs, um, that they might make use of, um, especially if they continued in a low-wage job. For example, CalFresh, nutrition assistance, the federal earned income tax credit, and, and Medi-Cal health insurance. Um, given these goals, California adopted policies that differed from many other states in 1998, and these policies, uh, these policies have generally endured um, throughout the life of CalWORKs. Um, I'll mention three examples. One is, is sanction and time, or two are sanction and time limit policies. Most states terminate grants to families if um, adults are non-compliant with work requirements. So the, the services provided and the, um, the incentives given to it, uh, help families earn their way off of CalWORKs, um, if they don't um, take advantage of those services and if they are non-compliant with work requirements, they can be sanctioned and lose their portion of the grant. In California, only their portion and children remain eligible. In many other states, the entire family becomes ineligible. Um, likewise with time limits, when parents reach time limits in California, their children generally remain eligible for the program. In most other states, um, the entire family is terminated. Um, finally, California's work, work pays provision, so the amount of the grant you keep as you um, earn more money, the incentive to combine work with welfare is, is greater in California than it is in many other states. So three examples of the way that the program differs in California that is in line with um, policymakers' goals. Um, given those policies and, and, um, and goals, um, where is the program today? And, and here, if you look um, at first at figure two, you can see that the, the goal of protecting children um, is um, embodied in the fact that the program is mostly children. So this is the brown line is the percent of all California children who are aided by CalWORKs um, over time, and the gray line is the percent of adults in California re um, aided by CalWORKs, so um, adults who are themselves eligible for a grant. Um, and you can see that the, the line is far um, higher for children, um, indicating that most of the caseload is, is children and that it's about three quarters today. You can also see that the caseload grew um, during, the during and after the recession, and it's about now 12% or, or roughly one in eight children in California um, um, receives CalWORKs. In the rest of the country, it's not in your figure, this percent is about 4%. So California is assisting far, a far larger share of its children um, than are assisted in other states. Of course, that masks a lot of diversity across states and their policy differences and their program differences, but overall, California um, is assisting um, a larger share 
of its children. At the same time, the program was much bigger in the mid-90s, just before CalWORKs began. It was over 20% of California children um, had <coughs> access to a cash assistance grant. Um, then if you turn to figure one, um, you'll see a breakdown of the caseload by parent status. So the brown wedge, the 39% is the parent is aided and um, either in compliance with work requirements or, or making progress or in, um, generally has full access to welfare to work services. Um, and the three bottom bl blue and dark brown wedges are families where parents are aided or formally aided, but they're not fully in the welfare to work part of the CalWORKs program. And then the final wedge, the 34%, are families in which um, parents have never been eligible for CalWORKs. It's important to say that because of policy changes, and the two I'm thinking of here are the reduction in time limits starting in July 2011 and the, um, the increased exempt, the broadened exemptions for families with young children, children under two or two children under six, mean that that 39% act that is actually today smaller. Um, by our calculations using these 2009 data, it's more um, on the order of a quarter of parents are in that brown wedge um, today. So that's where the program is today. And um, given the major proposal on the table by the governor, but not only that, the, the, the proposals that have changed the program have cut grants, um, have reduced time limits, and have um, increased exemptions over the past several years, um, it is perhaps time for policymakers and the public to consider these two overarching goals of the program and to engage in a discussion about the policies that can help um, CalWORKs to achieve its goals and, its, and, and play its proper role in the safety net in California. And I think that that's part of the discussion that we intend and hope to have today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Carly. Well. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I, I'd first like to thank um, PPIC for accommodating us on timing. The, the, the reason for the early start is that we have a budget hearing this afternoon. Um, and what I'd like to start by doing is um, building off some of the, the, the policy questions that Christine was, uh, Carolyn was posing to us. Um, we're at that 15-year point in, in the life of the CalWORKs program, and we, before we started, we were sort of commenting back and forth that a number of us were actually involved in 15 years ago as it was sort of being formulated. I, I, I just want to sort of really emphasize the fact that the program, when it began, had a mixture of great fortune in that there, there were strong resources, we had a booming economy, um, and at the time we also had a federal structure to the program with caseload case reduction credits that really facilitated California's program. And um, the, as, as, as recently as the late 2000s, um, I, I would like to note that California's CalWORKs program did what most states' TANF programs did not do, which it was actually res recession responsive. And the fact that the caseload grew over the past few years is in no way sort of a weakness of the program. That's what s programs like this are supposed to do. So um, the, the, we're not starting from a premise of saying the program shouldn't have grown. The program sh should have done what it did. Um, we're at the point now where it's sort of flattening out and we sort of an can anticipate probably you know, gradual slight declines going into the future. Another caveat I'd just like to sort of offer is that as we approach policymaking around CalWORKs, there is a lot of limitation on the data available, by which I mean when people end their connection to the CalWORKs program, approximately half of them sort of disengage without much further information being available. So they leave the case, though a lot of them had history of working, whether they left because they now had secured sufficient income that they no longer w wanted to participate in the program or not, we can't assert that. What we can do is sort of looking back at the last year's data, for example, say about 20% of the people who left, left because they reported income <coughs> that met the standard for the, the program threshold. Um, about another 10% left because their youngest child aged out, reached age of maturity, and was no longer eligible. Um, and then the, the rest left for a sort of variety of, of sort of smaller coded reasons. 
as, as Caroline observed, there's been a history of, as the budgets have been constrained in California, um, health and human service budgets are two of the areas in which the state has greater discretion than in other parts, and so there have been budgetary pressures on the program, <coughs> first in the form of grant reductions, and then more recently in terms of <laughs> scaling the program down, both by reducing the maximum number of eligible months for adults, reducing the earned income disregard, and reducing the welfare to work service funding to the counties, and of course, in California, the counties carry out the program. So those have brought us to the point where, frankly, it's not the program we started 15 years ago, um, and we just have to acknowledge that. Um, in the last few years, the, the reduction pattern of, of funding, while budget sensible in the moment, and eminently so, because by exempting parents with the youngest children, that also reduced the requirement for childcare at its most expensive points, so maximum savings. However, had the consequence also of not engaging a large number of participants at the early stage of their involvement in the program and what may in fact have been their um, most optimistic period. When we look at the patterns of people leaving for employment, um, they tend to do so fairly early in their engagement period and when we look at EDD, UI data, um, clearly the longer someone is unemployed, the longer they are going to stay unemployed. Um, and that's the, you know, j just sort of background fact. As we look at our policy choices, at this point, there are obviously three major constraints that I'm acutely conscious of. I'm sure other people have others. First is the fact that we're in a period where poverty has increased, um, overall poverty and particularly child poverty in California. Um, unemployment has increased, and although it's declining, California still runs ahead of national unemployment data, so that is a first issue. Um, second factor that we have to be very sensitive to and, and not panic about but factor in realistically is the fact that the underlying federal program performance rules have changed. When we began the program it was with a relatively po advantageous caseload reduction credit allowance. As a result and through very good work on the part of the counties, a lot of hard effort, um, the program met its participation requirements up through 2006, 2007, we pretty much met it with some calculation adjustments. But by the, as a result of the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005, we're required to include in our caseload both the safety net component of adults who have timed or been sanctioned out of the welfare to work component of the program, and, we're and we start to lose access to the caseload reduction credit in the scale it existed. As a result, the state has not met federal work participation requirements for 2008 and 2009, um, anticipated well, subsequent years as well. Um, the potential consequence of that are ultimately financial penalties. The state has appealed the original penalties for 2008-2009 we sort of haven't had a final determination from Department of Health and Human Services about those appeals. Um, presumably at some point we reach a stage where we have to enter into corrective action to start to get closer to meeting what will be starting in 2013 a 50% participation requirement when we're currently at about a 23% participation requirement. So effectively, we're double, we have to double the participation requirement. If at some point we don't, and I don't, I don't want to pretend it's tomorrow because I don't know that it's tomorrow, but if at some point it starts to become a financial consequence, um, the cumulative penalties the state's now facing is about 147 million being appealed that grows with every successive year. So unless we do something that addresses it, there comes the point when in addition to whatever budget-driven problems we face, we start to put ourselves into a sanction-driven death spiral. And so we, we have to accommodate that reality. Um, third contextual issue, obviously, is the state budget. Um, and although the 
current proposal, you know, the governor's current proposal includes significant revenue increases based on the November election. Um, even then, we uh, clearly uh, people are very anxious about the cumulative revenue projections, and that's the universe in which we're living and having to make um, policy choices. So the, the questions that I would sort of want to just add to the, the, the discussion that Caroline started would be these. If we're, tr if we're having to live within financial boundaries that are re reducing or hopefully at some point staying flat, um, do we accomplish that by offering fewer services to everybody, in other words, reducing the dose? Um, do we prioritize rigidly among different groups of participants, early versus late or late versus early? In other words, the, that's the duration side of, of, of prioritization. Should we say that services are never assured, but rather it's a line case manager decision as to who needs services, who doesn't need services, um, which begs a lot of questions about have we equipped them with everything they need to know to know that. Um, should the program incentivize increased participation in work? Should it give some extra degree of financial benefit for hours of work over other activities. Um, on the education versus work discussion, which is, is part of any meaningful dialogue around welfare to work services, um, education, frankly, is not equally available to all participants in the program, either because of prior education experience, et cetera. So to the extent that we accommodate the education activity, we're putting fiscal boundary pressure on the overall program. And that's boundary pressure that will translate into loss of services or grants for somebody. So is an expectation that education always be paired with work activity a reasonable expectation? Um, at another fundamental level is the CalWORKs, should the CalWORKs program going forward be the default service system for people who have ever been in the program, recognizing that people's progress is not linear. People make steps forward, have reverses, et cetera. People obtain employment, lose employment. The one, us, one way of viewing it would be that once someone has successfully penetrated the labor market, then the barrier removal services that are inherent in the, in the Cal work system really have, have, have run their course and that someone who has lost employment through whatever reason, recourse would be to unemployment insurance and to the various work reattachment services available through the workforce in investment board structure. Um, EDD is sort of changing the alternative base period calculation process that would add advantage people with relatively lesser quarters of employment. So that becomes, I think, a more realistic resource looking in, into the future. Changing the lens for a moment and looking at the program through the child only program dimension. And as, as Caroline pointed out at the beginning, it's both a welfare to work program and a child well-being program. Um, are we still committed to the notion that <coughs> it's unlimited child only eligibility? Um, in some of the dialogue that has circulated in, in recent weeks and months, LAO has suggested possibly a durational maximum on that. Um, that would be a huge departure from where we are. Um, should there be required episodic labor market tests for people who are work eligible but are the adults in the child only caseload? If there are episodic labor ma market tests, should there be what should be the consequence of noncompliance? Are we w does that start us in a direction? towards full family sanctions, or would we rather have um, encouraged, facilitated, supported labor market tests um, that, that, that are, are less conditioned on, on continued participation? Finally, well, not quite yet finally, as a child well-being program, how do we embed in the child-only program some aspects that assure us collectively, the state, the community, that child's needs are being met. Um, 
Olivia Golden and Amelia Hawkins did a very useful recent publication from Urban Institute looking at the TANF child only cases and really raising some important levels of concern about well-being of children in various situations, including non-parent uh, caretaker situations. Um, and finally, what should the right income level be, income support level for the child only caseload? If that caseload's grant levels are within a zero sum environment that put pressure on other services and grants, somewhere there has to be a, a process that says this is where we want it to be and then tied in to the, with CalFresh benefits and others like that. So my goal is posing this is to say we all need to be part of <coughs> a policy dialogue um, to say, well, we shouldn't really be asked to come up with our own ideas. I, it, I, I know how we get there. I, I've done it in the past myself, but at the same time, I, th I think we have to get past that point. Um, and I've deliberately not tried to represent the administration's specific budget proposals. I think everyone in this room could probably quote them chapter and verse, but rather to sort of recognize that a, a governor's January budget proposal is a starting place um, that points in a s series of direction and poses a series of policy choices. What follows has to be an engagement where um, exactly the sort of people who are in this room become part of the conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, PPIC for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I've really been looking forward to it because this program is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I think it's very clear that it is in transition. So I think the title of our panel today is very appropriate. It's a very critical subject, too. Um, the program is in transition from both a policy and an operational standpoint. And I, I say that as a county administrator whose staff sees firsthand every day the realities of what this transition is in terms of the context of our economy and other local dynamics. Uh, if you don't believe me, they're all sitting right there in that row right there. Um, you can talk to them later. But I also say that from the perspective of somebody who frankly spent decades at the state level and I'm very proud to have helped negotiate and implement CalWORKS in the late 1990s when I was at CDSS. And I think as we have this discussion and we look towards the future, it's useful for all of us to think back to that time if you were there, if you weren't, ask somebody. And I have to acknowledge Dion Ariner, who's in the crowd here, a former assembly person who was there at the time. I think I saw Gail Gronert here, who was a key staff person at the time. The point is, is that we spent over a year after TANF was implemented in August of 1996, we spent over a year discussing, debating, yelling, <laughs> uh, shouting, uh, over what California's response was going to be to the federal TANF program. Uh, it's an experience that I'll never forget. It was a, a really a good experience and I would say candidly that that led to us coming up with a very strong and a very successful program that really does show what a strong partnership amongst state agencies, amongst the state and the counties, and all the different stakeholders, what that can produce in the way of successful programs. Um, and over the last 15 years, um, that success has shown itself because we've helped millions of recipients attain the work experience, training, and skills that they've needed to move off welfare into the workforce. And I don't think there's any question that the program has served as a critical safety net for low-income families and as the data you've seen suggests, particularly low-income children. Um, and when we talk about the program being in transition and how it's evolving and what the future might hold, I think it's very important for us to bear in mind some key principles that are important to us from the local level, but they are key principles that were really the heart and soul of this program when we negotiated it and when we implemented it. Number one, yes, we're focused on work. It's work first, but it's not work only. That was very important. And believe me, I was a big work first guy at the time. 
but we've learned a lot, and that's a very key principle. Work first, but not work only. Number two, mutual obligation. You know, local level governments, the state government in general, uh, is providing an array of services for clients, but at the same time, they have an obligation to do their part to carry through with consequences that they don't. And the third key principle that I'd mention is county flexibility to design a program that addresses local circumstances. And I think the counties clearly have done that. I've always viewed CalWORKs from day one as a work in progress, knowing from the start that there would have to be changes and adjustments made over time to respond to a changing economy, to respond to a number of different uh, ch things that would happen over time. To me, the question is whether we've made the right changes and or whether we're talking about making the right changes and what those changes are based on. So it's certainly true from the local level, from the local level perspective, that welfare slash cow works is changing, uh, largely because of the rapidly changing environment that the counties find themselves in. Um, our clients, our cow work clients now, many of them are experiencing great difficulty competing in the labor market, uh, particularly given the hit that the labor market has taken during this recession. They're competing against people who have advanced degrees and many years of skilled work experience for really a limited number of jobs, not just in Sacramento County, but throughout the state, a limited number of jobs that pay enough or offer sufficient hours to make ends meet for a family. So when we look at the CalWORKs program and we look at how it's evolving and where it might go, um, it's critical that we recognize those realities of the economy. The second thing that has to be bared in mind here, and Will made reference to this, but it's a very important point. The people we serve in the CalWORKs program have lives that are not linear. They are not linear because we'd love to, I think, think of the program like CalWORKs as this ladder to success, sort of an escalator. And if Frank Mecca was here, he does these hand gestures a lot better than I do. But um, the reality is it just doesn't work that way. And any caseworker that's worked with clients will tell you that. Uh, for every two steps they take up the ladder, there's almost always a step that they go back. And that's because of the, the, what these folks are dealing with in their lives every day uh, is the complexities and the complex circumstances they, they face in their communities. So when we see how the program's evolved and we start talking about what our time limit ought to be, uh, this is a very important consideration. Whether you're talking 60 months, whether you're talking 48 months, whether you're talking 24 months, um, it's true that the average length of stay on the CalWORKs program is about two years. It's always been about two years. Even through the recession, it's been about two years. Um, but that does not mean, and counties will tell you this loud and clear, that does not mean that someone who we work closely with to overcome these issues that they have to deal with to move into the workforce is able to stay there forever for the rest of his or her life. It just doesn't work that way. There continues to be bumps in the road. And what we have seen at the local level um, through this <laughs> downturn of the economy is families coming back. Families who might have spent those, those two years, an average of two years on CalWORKs, say they left in the late 90s or left early 2000s, they're coming back with this economy taking a nosedive over the last few years. And many of them are starting over. Uh, I encourage you, I, and I said the last panel I was on here, I encourage everybody to go over to our office over at 28th and P Street and see who's in that waiting room waiting to be served. You'd be amazed. Uh, you're going to see a mix. But I told the story of the guy sitting there in his sport coat and tie waiting to see his eligibility worker. Uh, and that's what's happening. So uh, they're there because they need a new start. And they need training to get into a whole new industry. So you might have had somebody who was in construction. Right? We're not doing much construction these days. So they've come in and they might need training so they can get into the service industry or something like that. That is the reality that we're seeing every day. And if we are not mindful of that when we start thinking about these time limits and how the time limits work, we could very well be in a situation where counties have nothing, nothing to offer to these folks. And I'd hate to see that happen. A third thing that the experience of the counties will tell you is that the initial agreement that we had in CalWORKs to have a mix of 
services, a mix of subsidized and unsubsidized work, training, education, and different kinds of services is, in my opinion, a real key to why the program's been successful. We've thought about this long and hard in those debates that we had that year. And our experience, I think, suggests that if we focus too hard on a work-only kind of message, we could have the reverse effect. We really could have the reverse effect because what the experience is in CalWORKs is, you know, and this has always been our mantra, it's more than just a sound bite, though. You get a job. You get a better job. Hopefully it leads to a career, right? And if our focus is too hard on things like unsubsidized employment, and penalties if you don't have an unsubsidized job, you're going to discourage clients from pursuing those part-time jobs, for example, which many times is the start that we need for them to take so that they do get a job, a better job, and hopefully a career. Now, I fully recognize and realize that we've got an issue in this state with our work participation rate. Absolutely. Uh, but it's not the first time that this state has been threatened by federal penalties, right? Uh, and I could give you some examples of things that um, uh, had potential consequences even higher than the one we're looking at at CalWORKs right now. The thing that I want to point out is that from the beginning, from the beginning, we have always sought to balance what we had to do to respond to the federal work rules with the additional activities that we knew in California we had to offer to make our program successful. We had to have a balance. And I remember those de debates, but it was a bipartisan discussion w that we had to do that. We knew that some of the things that we were offering in the program wouldn't count. But frankly, we also looked at the data very carefully of what we thought our clients would need, and we made some conscious decisions about how the program would be set up in that regard. So let's not lose sight of that. Um, now, the other thing I want to mention, too, is, yes, we're in a transition policy-wise, but if you go and you visit some county welfare departments, you'll see that we're clearly in a transition operationally, right? And for those who think that welfare departments can't respond very quickly uh, to changing circumstances, I encourage you to go out there and take a look because you're seeing, frankly, out of necessity, that counties are having to make some very dramatic changes. Um, last time I was here, I talked about the perfect storm that we're dealing with, where caseloads are going up to an all-time high at the same time, as you all know, our resources are being cut to the floor and below. And so counties have really reinvented, had to reinvent the way they do their job because the need is still very clearly there. So for example, what you're, what you've seen now, I think it's in more than 40 counties, are the development of what we're calling service, customer service centers. The message here is you don't, these days with technology, you don't have to walk into a welfare department to access the program or to talk to your caseworker. So essentially you can call in to like more of a, a customer service call center and you can get better service, quicker service, and get your needs dealt with. Uh, and you're seeing that throughout the state. Uh, and Frank, the counties are talking about ways that given the technology we have and that so many of us are going this way, ways that we can network so that if a given county has a real rush, you know, and they've got uh, an overload of cases that they're trying to deal with, another county can help out and get that person going in terms of the application process. So there is really is an evolving transition in welfare in terms of how the services are being offered. The last thing that I want to I, I note here um, before we open it up is, uh, or move on to Scott, is what we've learned from our experience and what we ought to keep in mind as we move forward, as the program evolves, is we gotta keep it simple. We gotta keep it simple. And I don't mean to say that in a derogatory way towards our staff or towards our clients. It's just the reality of what you deal with every day in a welfare department. Um, you have to be able to explain changes to workers and clients in very plain language, and, make, and the changes have to make sense to them, or you'll never be able to achieve the desired effect. So as we continue to have our discussion this year, and I appreciate Will's comments that this really is a continuing discussion, I think we have to uh, bear that in mind because try to imagine a CalWORKs orientation session in our, in our departments. And you're talking about these three different ways you can be in the program and how you might move between them and how your income disregard might change and how the time, you're going to get glazed eyes and discouraged people 
And that, that is what we have to be um, concerned about. So wrapping up, yes, CalWORKS has always been a work in progress. It always will be in some form of transition. And we have to be open to change in policy and in operations. That's the reality. But I hope that as we think about that, and as we think about future directions, uh, we pursue changes that are based on what we've actually learned from our actual experience and the realities we face. And I say passionately, we should not lose sight of those initial principles that we arrived at when the program was first created because they still apply and they are still the linchpin that will make the program successful. that am I coming through there you go. okay great more or less okay well um, I tend to speak loudly as it is so I think you'll all be able to hear me even in the way back by the cookies um, I was asked this morning to provide an economic context for the policy discussion around CalWORKS and as you can imagine that involved um, becoming familiar with quite a number of grim statistics um, related to the housing bubble collapse the financial crisis the Great Recession, the deepest downturn that this country, this state, has seen in generations. And so uh, this morning as I was walking through Capitol Park and my head was swimming with these grim statistics, a voice floated across the lawn, sort of across from Westminster Presbyterian. And it was a lovely voice, a soprano, um, solo, and it sort of invaded my consciousness, all these grim thoughts about the recession. And it turns out a woman was out there singing somewhere over the rainbow, just by herself, standing next to a tree. And I thought, whoa, what a divergence from what I'm thinking about to what she's singing about. Um, and uh, she wasn't quite as good as Judy Garland, but it was lovely nonetheless. And it, it, I guess it sort of provides a metaphor for what I want to do over the next few minutes, which is walk you through some um, undeniably grim statistics about um, the economy, where we've come from, where we seem to be headed but also perhaps ending um, on a somewhat hopeful note about what public policy um, can achieve in this state and in this nation if we set our sights in the right direction. So I guess the first place to start from is just to recognize the fact that the Great Recession really blew a huge hole in California's labor market. I mean, if you think about it, the downturn really started in California just about five years ago in July of 2007. That's when we sort of tipped, employment peaked, and we started our downturn a few months before the national recession was declared. Over the next three uh, years, we lost 1.3 million jobs. 1.3 million jobs just disappeared in California over a three-year period. Our unemployment rate, it's hard to believe, just five years ago, we had a 5% unemployment rate in this state. 5%. It shot up over the next three years by September of 2010, peaked at 12.4%. That was 2.2 million Californians. By September of 2010, well over 2 million Californians were out of work as a result of the Great Recession, whereas prior, well under 1 million were unemployed in this state. And Disturbingly, a large share of those two million were actually unemployed for long periods of time. It wasn't like you lost your job and came right back into a new job just a few months later. What was happening, about half of the unemployed in California were out of work for more than six months. About half of the unemployed, half of jobless Californians out of work for substantial periods of time. That's very concerning because I think a lot of us realize that the longer you're out of the labor force, the harder it is to break back in and get a job, particularly if you're an older 
worker um, or if you have lower levels of education. It's just hard to be out of the labor market for that long and jump right back into a job. So very distressing for more than two million Californians plus their families. Um, but I wanted to focus in briefly here on what happened to single mothers and their families. This is one of the charts you have. Um, there's a two-page, double-sided, uh, one-page, double-sided CVP handout. Um, this next point I'm going to mention is illustrated in one of those charts. Um, the employment rate, the share of single mothers in California with jobs dropped dramatically during the recession. Um, back in 2007, around 70% of single mothers were in the labor market, had jobs in California. You can see from that chart, we've come down every year. Every year, fewer and fewer working age single mothers in California are employed to the point where, as of 2011, it was below 57%. So a 12 percentage point decline over a four-year period. Essentially, we're back to the level of employment that we saw back in 1995. It hasn't been this low for single moms in the workforce since 1995, which was the year before we saw federal welfare reform. So the one way to think about this in summary for these moms is that uh, the expansion, all the gains we saw post-welfare reform for employment of single mothers has evaporated. It's gone. We're back to where we were prior to um, implementation of welfare reform federally and in our state. Given this grim economic landscape, it's not surprising that child poverty has also shot up. That's the, um, I've got a chart on the other side of your handout that, that illustrates that. Um, we have just over, we've got about nine and a half million children in California, just under 10 million Californians are kids. In 2010, about 2.2 million of them were in poverty. So around one out of four, Around one out of four Californians as of 2010, the most recent data we have available, were living in a household that was below the poverty line. That's a half a million more than back in 2006. So prior to the recession, and between 2006 through 2010, we had 500,000 children fall into poverty in California, which is, it, just to put it into context, that's about the population of Fresno, the city of Fresno. So it's a huge number, a huge run-up in terms of um, the poverty rate affecting children in California. Now, the news is not all bad. Things are not really, things are bad, but things are getting better to some extent for some Californians. Um, the economy is slowly healing. As I said, the job market sort of hit its trough in September of 2010, and we've been slowly on the men since then. We've added 260,000 jobs to the economy. That's about one out of five jobs that we lost, right? We lost 1.3 million. We've gained back about 260,000, but that's not even accounting for the fact that we need more to, to make to account for Californians who have moved in to working age during that period. So we really need several hundred thousand more. But if you just look at the 1.3 million we lost, we've gained back about one out of five in the last year and a half or so. And our unemployment rate is now below 11%. January, it hit 10.9%. We haven't seen un the unemployment rate in the state below 11% for three years. So that's, you know, some, so there's, a, there's some positive news here. We're on the mend, the economy is healing, but while things are headed in the right direction for a lot of California families, I mean, it's undeniable that they really are not feeling the benefits of sort of the turnaround that we've seen. A lot of families are still living through the Great Recession. The recession never really ended for them. The unemployment rate remains high. 10.9% is, is, is disastrously high, even though it has come down from over 12. Um, and some analysts, including the Legislative Analyst Office, are projecting double-digit unemployment rates for the next couple of years. We could be in double-digit unemployment through 2014, according to the LAO's November fiscal forecast. Um, we also have a couple million Californians still out of work, and just under half of them have been out of work for six months or longer. So this problem of long-term unemployment remains stubborn. It persists. Um, about half of Californians remain out of work for long periods of time, even as things um, slowly get better. Um, at the same time, just briefly acknowledge that state budget cuts have hit some, many of these same families um, who are living through the hardships of the recession. We've seen cuts to CalWORKs, to childcare, 
um, higher education costs are going up for families. So a lot of these families have sort of seen a one-two punch from the impact of the recession, the loss of jobs, loss of income, um, and then some loss of services that they had otherwise had access to. Just to close, I want to raise this question. Why should we care about this? Why does any of this matter? Well, there's different ways of answering that question. You know, one way, I, I'm sort of, I approach things from a research basis, so I like to know what rigorous research tells us about um, low-income families in our state and in our nation. Uh, you know, one thing that research shows is that children who grow up in poverty are less likely to complete as many years of school as their peers. They're less likely to work, they'll earn less money, and they're more likely to live in poverty than many of their peers who did not grow up in households below the poverty line. So that sounds a little grim. So what's the hopeful note that I promised you at the beginning? That is that there is some good news that research points to, um, which is that even modest increases in income, I mean, even in the range of $3,000 a year for very low income families can sort of counteract what some researchers call the long reach of early childhood poverty um, can improve children's life chances. So just modest boosts in income, $3,000 a year, can, that may not mean a lot to a lot of folks in this room, but that could mean a great deal to a family earning less than $25,000 a year. You give that family a little more income, that makes a huge different in difference in terms of the children in that family, their academic achievement, um, the kinds of earnings that they see when they become adults and move into the workforce goes up substantially according to um, rigorous uh, research conducted throughout the nation. So I, I wanted to leave you on that hopeful note. Of course, you know, that's a big um, push there. Getting families additional income um, kind of runs up against the fact that the state is facing and, you know, continues to face a huge budget shortfall. But it's sort of like if there's a will, there's a way. This is not a problem that cannot be solved. It's a problem that can be solved with the right kinds of public policies. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> That's applause for the entire panel, as well as the hopeful note that Scott uh, uh, left us with. Um, we're going to take a couple minutes um, to have a little conversation before opening it up to questions um, from those of you who have come. So if you have some questions, get them uh, ready. And um, you know, let, let me start with a question about work. Um, a, a clear theme in the comments of our, our panelists was um, reflecting upon how the TANF program and CalWORKs um, back in 96, 97 was built upon an expectation of work. Um, the context then was one of a fairly strong economy, um, uh, a fairly robust uh, amount of resources, services, and supports to connect people to work-related activities. Um, as Scott said, we had some pretty successful and, and other panelists' um, experience in terms of moving people from welfare uh, into work. Um, at the same time, we heard from all of you about some significant impediments to um, our ability to advance um, the goals of work in the current environment around the, the rece recession, um, some of the rules that the federal government has uh, articulated over the years, um, but also some of the, the decisions that California policymakers have made. Um, this uh, notion that, that Bruce uh, spoke to very directly from his experience that um, we're not going to hold children accountable for the actions or the inactions of their parents was a very deep value um, and goal of policymakers in 96 that has contributed to um, a, a different looking caseload today. Um, fiscal circumstances that have compelled uh, some of the exemptions from work that uh, Will and, and Caroline spoke to. Um, the fact that we um, today have roughly 25% of adults who are aided who are required to work. So I, I was hoping our panel could talk a little bit more about, so, what would you recommend to state policymakers? That here we are in 2012, let us stipulate it's a different context than we had in 96, 97. Um, but how do policymakers reinforce and support our goals, our policy goals around work, when we have such a limited number of people in the program today who actually are required to work or participating in work, um, but also recognizing the recession? I know this is a hard conversation to have when we have such a tough economic environment, but I, I know none of you are pointing to that and saying, well, there's just no, no opportunity here. So what, what would you point to as the, the single most important thing the policymakers could um, pursue in terms of really reinforcing work in the context of our economic environment, the policy decisions we've 
uh, made um, and uh, budget decisions. Bruce, why don't we? Why don't we oh, start I hope you guys will that question. I thought you guys <laughs> will that question. Well, I think Kim. Uh, first of all, I would not say that we should pull the focus away from going to work. I, I'm not suggesting that at all. I still think that has to be the fundamental driving force for the program. But I do think, in talking with policymakers, there has to be an awareness of what it takes these days to get a job and what we're dealing with in the economy and what kind of jobs are out there. Um, so that's why I raised this question about what is an appropriate time limit, too, because I think there has to be a recognition that, you know, Sacramento County, we still have an unemployment rate of, I think it's over 11 percent, isn't it, you guys? Um, I mean, yes, Scott, things are getting better, but you still have staggering unemployment rates in many counties. And I, I just think we have to bear that in mind. And um, while I would not uh, change the overall goal of the program to get people into jobs. What is it going to take for you to get a job and move on and get a better job? I don't think we should go away from that at all. But we have to be real about what's involved in that. And in dealing with the federal government, um, as I said earlier, I, I think there are ways that we can address this work participation rate issue. But I'd hate to see us make bad decisions that we're going to regret in the program because we're trying to get past that issue. So I think what I would just encourage is a realistic perspective on what it takes to get a job and how long that might take. Will, state perspective? First, I, I, I'd like to emphasize that I don't consider whatever we do or think about or talk about to be driven by just work participation requirement issues. The, I, I, I'm, but, it, but it's there as a factor. It sure and is. We, we yes. can't be blind to it. The, I, I'm, I'm more struck by sort of Scott's observation about the importance that what, what he described as a modest income increase for a family can produce in terms of life trajectories for children who, who are otherwise living in poverty. And truthfully, on, on the, any fiscal scenario I can anticipate, the only way that we're going to get those income increases in those family settings is by a combination of earnings, the um, earned income tax credits and vehicles like that. So the, while, while not saying work only, work only, the, the notion of, of, of keeping a very strong focus on what it is that we think will help connect people as rapidly as possible has to be, I think, a strong piece of what we're discussing. Um, the counties over the last uh, couple of years have had very good experience um, in terms of sort of developing out uh, subsidized employment, grant the, uh, basically right. grant diversion options that starting with the federal stimulus and then supported by <coughs> state legislative action over the past couple of years has facilitated. That shows a great deal of promise. My sort of encouragement is always move that sort of very effective intervention as early as possible in the engagement process. Yeah. Um, don't use it as a last resort, use it as a first resort, um, and, and approaches like that. The, given the economy, given the jobs picture, there is no perfect answer uh, to, to the question. I mean, I could sit here and torture it forever, and at the end <laughs> of the day, we're all going to sit there and say, yeah, but. And we'll be left with a lot of yeah, buts. But I, that can't stop us taking the policy steps that would seem to position people as advantageously as possible under some terrible sets of circumstances that boundary our decision making. Caroline, is there some uh, guidance that research can um, provide policymakers as they grapple with these uh, difficult policy choices in terms of how to advance the, the twin goals that all four panelists spoke to around uh, improving child well-being as well as advancing uh, welfare to work for those parents that are eligible for work? Um, well, I guess, again, no, no perfect solution, but um, um, certainly in this economy and, and also um, in a, an economy that's increasingly focused on, on skilled workers, um, that some attention to the skills building among, um, among welfare recipients, but not only, um, but workforce training um, for a broader group who might need it um, is something that our economy needs and that may be especially um, timely um, given the realities of the job market. Scott, comments you want 
Um, yes, I work for the California Budget Project, but I'm not in charge of writing a budget, so I understand it's easy to stand <laughs> on the outside and say, why don't you just do this or not do this? Um, but I think, you know, given the situation we're in now, the fact that it's very, it seems very unrealistic that many families, even those who, you know, the 99% who are willing to try very hard, these families are just not going to be able to move into, into jobs and meet the kinds of requirements envisioned in the, the governor's proposal. So this seems like a year in which maybe we should be seeking a holding pattern, maybe sort of a hold the line um, and, and perhaps have a smarter approach to, having, to meeting um, the work requirements um, imposed by the federal government that we haven't talked here at all about um, other strategies that could be used to meet work requirements without making the kinds of structural changes um, that have been proposed. The problem, of course, is that these things all cost money. Um, and this is a $1 billion solution in the governor's $10 billion set of solutions to get through the ne the, this year and the 2012-13 year. So, I mean, just keeping in mind it is a budget solution, I think if we could hold the line on CalWORKs, perhaps redirecting um, some of the resources that are envisioned in the governor's tax initiative that is now projected, at least by the Department of Finance, um, to provide substantial billions of dollars to help with the state's um, budget shortfall in the coming year, I think it would make sense um, to redirect some of those dollars, uh, perhaps toward the CalWORKs program, to avoid, um, at least in the short term, some of the really devastating cuts that would otherwise be envisioned. So it seems like there is a revenue solution out there on the horizon if the voters go along with the governor's um, proposed tax initiative. And some of those um, dollars could be used to help offset the state's budget shortfall, thereby making unnecessary the need for the kinds of reductions envisioned in this proposal. Well, I know there's going to be a, a lot of um, conversation uh, throughout the California community as well as in the legislature about the governor's budget proposal. I, I, I would note that the proposal does reflect um, uh, an interest on the part of the administration, it would seem, in, in not, if you will, kicking the can down, down the alley another year. Um, the reductions that um, began in this program in 2009 during the Schwarzenegger administration were characterized as temporary, uh, one time, uh, uh, short term and then it became a second year, and then a third year. And um, I think as the administration has acknowledged, um, those uh, policy decisions driven by the budget have, um, are really inconsistent with the work first orientation of the program, uh, the fact that we are exempting so many people from work requirements in a program that is, is about work and as uh, Will indicated, uh, it puts the state in, in jeopardy of penalties. Um, at the same time, I think one of the themes from this conversation is that the federal law provides some real constraints in terms of how states uh, are measured in terms of their performance and the implications that has for the fiscal penalties. Um, let me just, before we open it up, Will, maybe I'll pose the question to you. If, if you had to call out one, one change in federal law that you think would really help support California's uh, ability to advance a program that really uh, in a meaningful way balances those um, twin goals of uh, well-being for children and, 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 and work, what, what would you call out? Where, where should California be focusing its uh, efforts in, the, in Congress? Probably the thing that would help us the most is if the, we could get partial credit for partial participation. That would make a great deal of difference. I mean, to, to, to Todd Bland, who's our welfare to work deputy, and I were just chatting this morning, and we were lamenting that when the D Democrats had a majority, they didn't pass TANF reauthorization then. And so, in a sense, forewent the possibilities for some progressive change to the structure of the program. The changes that did occur occurred in a different environment and are much more restraining. We've certainly asked the administration, to, the federal administration, to look at all of the administrative authority they have that could ease the partial participation issue. And the feedback we basically get is that this has to be done through legislation. And so that becomes a, a very steep hill to imagine getting up at this point. Yeah, those federal guardrails are, are significant, as right. is the state's uh, fiscal context with huge